Okay, so today on my fairly home territory in Devon with Roy Harknett. Thanks very much for agreeing to talk to us today, Roy. Um, best describe you as a veteran, veteran stable lad. Well, yeah, you could call me that. <laughs> right, first of all, Roy, this is an unusual start for one of these. Show us your tattoo, will you? There, they're, 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 they're not many stable lads love their horses so much they get their names on them. So, um, what's the awesome, what's the story? Well, his name was Barberin, and he was owned by Johnny Big, who also owned Oxo, the Grand National winner. And he came to us as a, a backward three-year-old, unbroken, and I saw him and I thought, I like that horse. So, we became buddies. And um, he was a lovely horse, gentle. You could do anything. You could walk. I've, I've actually walked between his back legs. He stood over 17 hands, three eye. And it was just a pleasure to look after. And you were looking after him for Willie Stevenson? And Willie Stevenson at Royston in Hertfordshire. Uh, I went there in 1957. And I think I left there 1960. Okay, so how old were you when you started working for him? Well, I, I, had, I left home when I was 14 and I went there just for the Easter, just to see whether I liked it. And I did like it. And he said to me parents, well, he can stay. He said, I'll get him in the school here and he can finish his schooling in Royston. So that's basically what I did. And uh, some of the best years of my life there. Really enjoyed it. Great life, great friends I've made and still friends with and um, it was just a fantastic time in my life. Now, now Willie Stevenson uh, got, is going back a bit and but for people that don't know he trained uh, three times champion hurdle winner Sir Ken, the 1950 Derby winner Arctic Prince and Grand National winner Oxo yeah. so he was a big he was a big yard back when you started working. For yeah him. he was he was you know sort of well known through the racing game and uh, he was a character, really was a character. And um, up until about two, maybe four years ago, we used to have a reunion every year in Royston. And uh, his youngest daughter is still alive, used, used to come along as well. And um, before he died, um, Dennis Ryan, he came along with Marcella, his eldest daughter. And I believe Elizabeth come one year. She was she was the the third. I think third or fourth daughter. So where where did you you move to Royston? So yes, where, I where moved. Where, where were you? Where did you move from? Where were you brought up? I was brought up in Enfield, North London. Right. So you was a city boy. Well, yeah, but although, yes, I was a city boy, but I always loved horses. Um, well. Started off with donkeys at the Sands at Blackpool, and then uh, when I moved, well, we lived in Enfield, and I used to help the Coleman to fold his sacks up, and because he had an horse, he had an horse called Churchill. I can remember one day I come home after helping him, a bit black, and um, I, I said to me mum, Churchill's not all that well; he's ill. And she thought I was talking about Winston Churchill, but I wasn't. I was talking about Churchill the horse. <laughs> um, but that was, and there was a lot of horses around them times. And believe it or not, there was more horses killed or put down in the 50s and 60s than any other time in history, even through the wars and that, because... All the bakers' horses, all the milkmen's horses, uh, throughout the country were put down, and the electric motors come in. So it's um, it was a very sad time for horses, really. But uh, that's the way life is, unfortunately, at the moment. But wh where you were working with Willie Stevenson, they were obviously well looked after racehorses. Oh, but the staff had it quite hard, didn't they? Oh, the staff had it very hard. You were only ever late once and you only went up the yard with dirty boots once because you've got such a good hiding that you didn't want to have that again. You, you actually mean a good hiding as well, don't oh, you? Oh, yes. He, he'd kick you up the backside, smack you around the head. And, uh, yeah, it was... But it was, good, it was good times and all. 
but there was a lad that ended up going to concrete steps chase oh away. yeah one day i think his name was because we all had nick nicknames i think his name was popcorn and he didn't get up one morning and um willie come in and he just dragged him out of bed threw him down these concrete stairs and hit him with a long tom. <laughs> and what's a long tom? A long tom is what the huntsmen have when they go out hunting. It's a, a, a short cane with a bone handle and then a, a leather plaited whip at the end of it. Right, so it, it's, things have changed a bit now. Oh, you're not allowed to do nothing now. Well, and also, you don't mind me saying, you had a bit of a terrifying initiation as well, didn't you? <laughs> yes, I did. I was stripped greased and um, put in a hay net and hang, hang, hung up in a uh, hay barn for, well, best part of the afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the boss turned a blind eye to all that sort of stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah. That, that, was, that was all part of the being part of the racing fraternity, I suppose. Uh, so when you were there, you were 14, so it must yeah. have been quite scary. You lived in a hostel. Yeah, I lived in a hostel... Uh, well, I, I went there when I was 14, which was the Easter, and he said to me parents, well, if he likes it, he can stay, and I'll um, arrange for him to go to the local school here, which he did. And I quite, you know, I enjoyed it, because it was away from home. You were free. You had to be in weekdays by quarter past 10 and half past 10 on a Saturday, which was great. So you went out... And, and you used to go to the pictures, but in them days, I think it was under two shillings, about one anointments, I think, to go to the pictures. And you couldn't afford to take your girlfriends, so you met them inside. <laughs> was, there any, was there any girls in, working in the yard? No. I, I did say to him when I got up a bit older and a bit bolder, I said, Governor, I said, why haven't we got any girls working here? And he said, well, Roy, he said, I've got... Uh, Five daughters, he said, and that's enough to look after and worry about, he said. <laughs> I won't say what else he said to me. <laughs> no, you, yeah, carry on, you, sorry, can you can imagine what he was saying. <laughs> now, you, you, right, so it's hard work, but how many horses would you look after and ride out? Well, you would look after a minimum of two and maybe up to four, or you could even have five, but... Mostly, uh, it varied because you had the flat horses that was running sort of from uh, March through to October, November, and then the jumpers would come in September time, or not, in, maybe a bit earlier than that, end of August, and then you had the yearlings coming in for next season. So in, in August was your busiest months, so you might have five or six horses to look after. Not that they would, some would be winding down, so they would just eventually be turned out uh, to grass, but the colts would never go out. Um, they were stuck in their boxes, and they may, may be let loose in a paddock um, now and again, just on their own to have a pick of grass and get their minds back into normal being horses. Yeah. Instead of race horses. So you used to? Did you used to ride them out then? Yeah, I was. Where, where did you? I mean, you you used, used to hang around with the the Bakers and the Coleman's horses. Oh, yeah. But how did you learn to ride? Um, well, I used to go to in Chinkford. There was a riding school, and I eventually plucked up courage on my own and went up there and started mucking out, and I got a free ride. Right. So this is this is before you started working. With yeah, you, before then. I so started you, working in racing. And you um, now they. They used to clothe you in some nice clobber. Oh, yeah. we. It goes back years ago now. I can remember we used to have <coughs> one brown herringbone suit, which we used to call a muck sack suit. All the lads called them muck. And then when you when you had a, a looked after some horses that won races, you might get an extra maybe 15, 20 pound. You could afford to... Uh, buy a grey suit, a nice, you know, so it's smart to go out with on a Saturday night. <clears throat> and um, you used to get a pair of jobbers and a pair of boots, which were ex-army ladies' uh, boots, what they used to wear, because we all had fairly small feet then. 
And uh, so that's what we used to get. What, land girl boots? Yeah, land, land army girl boots, yeah. Now, did the, so you, you talk about um, the winners, did the owners used to bung you at all? Yeah, they used to come round, you had good owners and bad, some owners never used to bung you anything, some owners used to come round and maybe, you know, give you a fiver. I mean, nowadays they get a percentage of the winnings and all that, so it's all changed a lot now, for the better, for the, and people on the television do recognise the, the work that goes on with racing, whereas years ago I don't think they ever thought about it. Now you're telling me that um, Mr. Biggs, the owner of Oxo, yeah. treated you all to a, a party at the Bull Hotel after after it it won. Yeah, and that's when you suddenly got a taste for whiskey. You, yes, <laughs> well we all went up and sort of ordered lager and limes and stuff like that. I mean we were only sort of well 17, 18 years old then, and. Um, as soon as they said, oh, Mr. Biggs paid for it all, we went on the scotch and orange. <laughs> and um, we all had a good drink that night, and it was quite um, quite enjoyable. It was a really nice party. Everyone enjoyed themselves. And um, everyone turned up for work the next morning because it was a Sunday, and the horses still going out on a Sunday morning. And the best thing for an hangover is walking over a dung hill because the ammonia just clears your head. <laughs> <laughs> now, you, you said that Willie Stevenson was, you know, in modern day terms, he was quite a brute, you really, with, with, with the staff, but yeah. he defended his staff. Oh, yeah. If you were right, he would back you to the hill. You're telling me something that happened at um, Wincanton. Well, it was a, a, fr a good friend of mine who now lives in Norway, John Moore. <clears throat> he was had a ride at Wincanton, and uh, he went with the governor, <coughs> excuse me, and he um, was walking into the weighing room and he said, um, oh, Captain Ryan Price was coming out and he hit him round the head. And Willie noticed it and he said, um, when he came out of the weighing room, John, he said, uh, what did Captain Ryan Price hit you for? He said, I don't know, so I just said good morning to him and he hit me round the head. Oh, he did, did he? I sort that out. And he went over to him in the paddock when all the owners and trainers were there, ready to load, you know, leg the jocks up. And he said, um, don't you ever lay a finger on any of my boys again. If they want correcting, I'll correct them, not you. And he was really poking his finger at him and telling him where to get off, basically. But that's the sort of man he was. And loads of things that I could me and Neville Hill we had to go up the house one day and you only went up the house if you were in trouble <coughs> so I said to Neville what have you done wrong he said I don't know I've done nothing wrong he said what about you I said no I ain't done nothing wrong so he goes up there and we goes into the office it was about half seven one night and um he said, I've called you two up here because you're the sensible ones. And we both sort of snickered a little bit. He said, I'm going to give you a pay rise. All the lads are going to get a 50 pence pay rise. He said, and while you're up here, if you want to pay uh, snooker, because he had a big snooker room table with all the trophies, what he'd won all around the, uh, on the shelves around it. And um, he, um, he said... There's 10 bob for the winner, which was like a week's wages to us, near enough. So we come away with 50 pence each. <laughs> so that was, that was, um, that's the good side of him. He, you know, he wasn't all bad.